Welcome to Maple Leaf America. I'm on the roof of the Hilton Hotel in Atlantic City, New Jersey, known to many as America's favorite playground. And recently, this area has developed as hockey's favorite playground. We'll take a look at youth and professional hockey throughout the Garden State. Plus, we'll meet an Ontario-born NHLer who's a member of the Philadelphia Flyers Hall of Fame. And a look at the Jersey Devil. It's all ahead on this edition of Maple Leaf America. Back on ground level, thank goodness, on Maple Leaf America, where we are bad. We are nationwide. We are truly bi-coastal. Last week in Seattle, this week on the Atlantic Ocean in Atlantic City. Hey, my Uncle Jerry. Lots of fun for you this week. We start with a visit with a former NHLer, great goal scorer, born in Ontario, Windsor area, works and lives about 20 miles down this beach. His name is Tim Kerr. Corner, Kerr digging it out, shoots one, he scores! The hat trick! After all Tim these Kerr. years, Tim the Kerr is still goal. on the power play in the delightful seaside community of Avalon, New Jersey. I used to summer here when I was playing for the Flyers, and um, you know, it's, it's a great place to be. The, the lights blink in the wintertime, and you get to get up every day and see the ocean and the water, and uh, it's real quiet, and you're only an hour and 10 minutes from Philadelphia, and um, it's, a real, it's a real neat place to live. It's, a, you know, it's busy in the summertime, but uh, you know, so when I retired, my wife, whose family retired down here, and rather than making a summer residence, we made it full time. We built another home and, and have been here ever since. Power play is an appropriate name for a successful real estate business. He still holds the NHL record for PP goals in a season, 34 in 85-86. He once had five in a single playoff series against Pittsburgh. I was never really a, a goal scorer coming up through hockey and, and in junior hockey. My last year junior, I had 40 goals. Um, but I think it was more, uh, I was a late developer. I was always a big kid, but obviously wasn't the most coordinated kid on the ice. And um, as I got older, it, it certainly came together. Um, but even when I came to the Flyers, you know, hadn't scored, scored that much in junior, didn't play any minor league hockey, so it was kind of scored 22 my first year in pro, 21 or 22. And uh, it was my third year that you know, things started to come together. From 1983 through 1987, Kerr reeled off four consecutive 50-goal seasons. But his productivity in front of the net came with a price. Injuries. Kerr went under the knife almost a dozen times for various breaks, bends, and blowouts. Twice we went to the finals, and both times I was on the injured list. One with my shoulder, which in the, that summer I had five operations on that, and then another with my knee, which kept me out. But um, you know, it, it was a good run. I mean, we had a lot of fun. Uh, the Flyers organization is a class act uh, from the first time I was ever there to, uh, you know, the day I left. Uh, they were always very good and, and they basically, uh, you know, they protected their players and, 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 and looked after them. And uh, it became, uh, it's, I think it's a credit to them that a lot of the players stay in the area when they retire because they were so well looked after here. Kerr may have had a hockey Hall of Fame career had he stayed healthy. He's happy to be recognized by his extended family in the Flyers Hall of Fame. You take your kids up there to basketball or hockey games or something, it's neat to see your name in the rafters there and certainly more for them than me. But, uh, you know, it's, it just puts you back into their family, you know, and it's something that uh, obviously I'm very proud of. Kerr's just as proud of his Ontario hometown, where he often gets back to visit his parents. It's a great little hockey town. You know, we had a double rink right in town, and, and basically, being a Canadian boy, that's all, that's all I ever did was play hockey. Uh, you know, with my, I have three boys now who are into basketball, soccer, lacrosse, and football, and everything else, and it's just, uh, when I look back, you know, it was pretty much hockey. 12 months a year, and if there wasn't any ice, we were playing on the street. I always liked the Chicago Blackhawks. I don't know if it was because of their uniforms or uh, or what. It was. Obviously, the Red Wings were were big, but I was always a Chicago guy. 
uh, Tony Esposito. Um, you know, of course, we had the Red Wings right across the, the border, but it was sometimes tough to get over there without getting mugged. Kerr waited instead to get mugged in the NHL in creases all over North America. A dream come true. Well, Maple Leaf Gardens, I mean, that was the place to, uh, to go to. I only went there a couple times as a kid, but then was able to play there when I played with the Kingston Canadians uh, playing in Toronto. And it was always a pretty big highlight in junior to play in Maple Leaf Gardens. And, uh, you know, great rink, small rink, you know. You still always get a kick out of the ushers every time. It was probably <laughs> the only rink that had ushers like that other than Montreal. But I wasn't, didn't play in Montreal till I was pro. Bad weather prevented us from getting a first-hand look, but Kerr is an accomplished pilot, often flying to family homes in Vermont and the Cayman Islands. He also flies to conduct his charity business, combining his two largest passions. So I, when I retired, I started my own 501c3, which is a nonprofit organization. And uh, between golf tournaments, and I do a run once a year, and uh, raise money for children's charities in the Delaware Valley. And uh, it's great. It's probably what I spend most of my time on is uh, working with charities, and it's the most satisfying and gratifying for me to be able to give back and, and help raise money, and uh, it's done very well. One of my, probably the biggest thing I do is I have a program called Power Play for Life, and what it is is organizations and individuals donate so much every time the Flyers score a Power Play goal. And um, that's been doing really well. And this year, with them calling all these penalties for instruction and stuff, we're off to a good start. Kerr has lots of experience with kids. He has five at home. And that's probably the reason I'm not back involved in hockey. Uh, you know, I, I like being home every night and then being involved with, with everything that they're involved with. As for his other family, an hour to the west in Philly. After last year, you know, they were one of the most talented teams, but just couldn't get all on the same page and uh, they definitely needed a guy to come in and take control and bring everybody together and I think uh, Hitchcock's going to do that for him. Big hands and a big heart. Tim Kerr's an Avalon Hall of Famer. On the famous boardwalk here in Atlantic City where you got to watch out. There are boardwalk bullies around. That's right, the Boardwalk Bullies, second year ECHL franchise. Frankly, it's a pretty tough sell in this market. Lots of distractions on and off the ice. Atlantic City is a town with chronic, potentially addictive distractions. Enough so that one NHL GM thought it would be best not to send his prospects here. I noticed the new guys that usually come in and start gambling, then they usually start fading away. That's uh, a lot that happened to me last year anyways. I came in here a ball fire and was gambling and losing too much money. So I try to tell the guys to pretty much stay away, but uh, go, go once in a while and have fun. No, I think the main focus is hockey, and uh, the emphasis has been put on that by most of the guys. Actually, all the guys, I don't know anyone that has uh, you know, an addictive gambling uh, habit. So it's just good, just come to the rink, work hard, and. You know, go home and just think about what you got to do the next day. Prepare yourself for, uh, for winning every day. There's a lot of a lot of distractions in cities, but I mean, uh, you know, we're here to play hockey, and you know, it's great to uh, come out of the rink and, and step on the boardwalk and, and look at the ocean. You know, and not too many guys have that option every day to come out of practice and uh, see those kinds of things. The bullies can successfully argue that gambling takes many forms in many places. So what's the big deal? It's obviously not a problem here. The Bullies have been near the top of the league in points since their inception last season. Which brings us to the next issue. Is that enough to sell suburbanites and maybe tourists on hockey in South Jersey? I didn't know this area very well, you know, from being from Central Jersey. I didn't really know the southern part of the state all that well, but uh, I believe it can work here. It's just, it is, uh, you know, people think, because it's a casino uh, little city, it's, uh, there's a, there is a lot of people who live here and, and are interested in hockey. I think it can really work here. You know, we just got to get out more in the community and be known more and, and make people want to come and see us. AC is known locally as a town that doesn't support sports franchises well. The independent minor league baseball team fan numbers are so-so. But pro hockey hasn't been around these parts in 50 years since the semi-pro Seagulls of the old Eastern League. 
Well, certainly this area has grown so much uh, recently. It's really a boom town, and you see new construction everywhere, and Atlantic City is making quite a resurgence. I think, um, you know, I, I think that for, for residents of this area to be able to put the Atlantic City name on a, on a pro sports team, both us and the surf, the minor league baseball team, I think that that's going to go a long way, you know, in, in, in helping the city continue its resurgence as well as, you know, I, I think that a good sports town benefits both us and the surf. So, you know, we're, we're really trying to create that atmosphere here where Atlantic City is known as a sports town and um, the fans uh, are able to come out and root for the team because it's Atlantic City's team. That moniker truly is a growing source of pride among local sports fans, mostly because of the built-in Garden State rivalry with the perennially powerful Trenton Titans in our north. The Bullies have begun to dominate the matchup ever since they pulled off a playoff upset sweep last season. As far as I'm concerned, unless you win the championship at the end of the year, you, you know, it's, it's going to be a disappointment in the playoffs. That's, you know, with, with Trenton here, that, that's our goal. We want to win the Kelly Cup, and anything short of that is a disappointment. So uh, it certainly was, and, you know, just fueling that rivalry that we have with them. Last year and now this year, they've established themselves as, a, you know, one of the premier teams in this league, and we like to think of ourselves as one of the premier teams in this league. And, you know, we're an hour and a half down the road from each other, so it's, it's natural that we're going to butt heads with each other. The fact that the, the teams are only about an hour drive apart, um, you know, and, and the strong the strong base, the fan base, the booster clubs of each team traveling from one city to the other really uh, has really enhanced the rivalry and made it, uh, I think, something special here in the East Coast League. The Titans have struggled on the ice this year, but they do not see the same demographic issues that confront the bullies to the south. The outlying areas, there's a, a million people. If you go in each direction, north, south, east, west, you've got a million people. If you go further south, uh, a good half an hour away, that's into Pennsylvania, Bucks County. I think that's a big part of it. I think 20% of our season ticket base comes from Bucks County. Our rink is generally uh, pretty full every night. Um, and the fact that Brian McKenna and Rich Lisk uh, brought and put a great team together year after year, uh, I think gives fans reason to come back. And we're kind of situated in a good area, a good hockey area too, between you know Philly and New York. And it's a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge about the game. And uh, I mean, coming to a Titans game is pretty affordable. A built-in rivalry, temporary state business subsidies, and a beautifully restored historical building all work to the bullies' favor. Fans that are not so close by, a feeling of urban isolation, and history working against. AC is a hockey market worth studying. Hopefully fans will be able to walk in just off the ocean and sit down just off the ice for many years to come. As we speak, the Boardwalk Bullies have the best record of the East Coast Hockey League. I'm joined by our host here at the Hilton, our home away from home in Atlantic City, Joe Sarnese. Hey, Joe. Hey, Rob, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you, buddy. How's the hockey here treating you? Great, great. It brought great enthusiasm to town. Good to see the fellows around town and something to root for. Uh, Midweek prices are right. Great games. We love them. Good. You're digging it. We're digging it. Vice President of Player Development at the Hilton, it sounds, you know, Vice President of Player Development, it sounds like you're sitting around watching people skate and, you know, kind of do a little scouting, but what does that mean in the casino business? I'm scouting, all right. I'm traveling <laughs> the country once a month, looking for high rollers, big players, such as yourself. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. I'm here at Atlantic City and uh, make them feel at home. Uh, talk a little bit about the resurgence of this fine city. It's a great time. Uh, phase two Atlantic City. Here at the Atlantic City Hilton, we're doing great things, great programs and shows. Uh, we're part of Park Place Entertainment, the largest gaming company in the world. Bally's, Claridge, Caesars, ourselves, and down here at the Ocean One Mall, Caesars is going to develop it into a uh, world-class shop such as Caesars has in Las Vegas, the form shops in uh, Las Vegas. We're going to do something very similar. Well, AC had some down years, but uh, it is indeed, you called it Phase 2 Atlantic City. It's, it's coming on strong here as we enter uh, the next millennium. Joe, thank you very much. Appreciate your hospitality. Thank you. My pleasure. We'll see you at the rink, and we'll see you in just a moment. We are going to take a look at uh, youth hockey in the state of New Jersey, and we'll take a look at the devil right after this. Hi, I'm Matt Thomas from Mississauga, Ontario, an assistant coach of the Atlantic City Boardwalk Bullies. Favorite leaf of all time, uh, I got a whole lot in the Hound line, Gary Lehman, Russ Cordino, and Wendell Clark. 
And I'd like to say hi to my uh, Paris, Mississauga, and all my buddies. Hi, my name is uh, Jerry Galloway. I'm from Mississauga, Ontario. Uh, my favorite Leaf of all time was Ricky Vive. I'd just like to say hi to all the guys back in uh, Missy, the T Dot, and the Roch. Welcome back to Maple Leaf America. Just for the moment, we are up here in North New Jersey to show you the home of the New Jersey Devils, the Continental Airlines Arena. For the past 20 years, you've probably wondered why were they called the Devils? We go right back downstate to tell you why. The South Jersey Pine Barrens are beautiful, yet dark and eerie. Spooky enough without some devil running around. This is what remains of the Jersey Devil home, where the Jersey Devil was born in 1735. Harry Leeds is the devil's great, 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 great nephew. When Mother Leeds had her 13th child, she said, if the baby is not healthy, I wish it to be the devil. The baby was deformed, and the 13th child became known as the Leeds Devil up until 1909, and then he picked up the name of the Jersey Devil. His goal is to get the story right for everyone. As with any legend, inaccuracies run rampant, including the location of the family's original house. One thing is for sure, generations of people in this area have believed in and feared the devil. One of the things that our parents always told us, don't go out after dark. If you go out after dark, the devil might get you. So it had a calming effect. It, had a, it was a disciplinary thing and it affected all the kids. No kid would venture outdoors at nighttime in our town. Images and interpretations of the devil's appearance differ greatly, as do the stories of his debauchery. To the best of our knowledge, through the family, he's never harmed anyone. He has been known, the Jersey Devil has been known to go out and kill cattle, kill chickens, but he did it for the benefit of the people that didn't have the food at the time. So the, the Jersey Devil was one that when he did something to harm an animal or something, he did it to feed the poor. The Devil as a philanthropist? Many over the years would disagree. Stories of terror, like the Devil feeding on dogs and children, have dominated the legend. People still go on devil hunts. Most stay clear of the barrens at night. This here is the exact location that the devil used to take his bath. A clean devil is a happy devil and a popular one. He's had a hockey team, a fighter squadron, and many other entities named after him. But that doesn't mean you can let your guard down. Always remember one thing. To be wary at nighttime when you're out in the pines that you want to be alert. You don't want to travel alone. That the Jersey Devil will not hurt you, but the Jersey Devil will be watching you. So make sure when you go in the pines in South Jersey that you are visiting a Leeds or a friend of the Leeds because the Jersey Devil has never been known to hurt anyone. Yeah, right. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, but I'm so scared right now. We'll be back after the funny hockey fan photo. Who said that? Time for another funny hockey fan photo, and we revisit a theme from a few weeks ago, the Rangers fan club. That's right. The Rangers actually have a fan club. The Rangers fan club. <laughs> Back after this.
Welcome back to Maple Leaf America. New Jersey faces a youth hockey problem faced everywhere, even in Canada, overzealous parenting. I had an incident this year already with a parent, and um, we asked him to leave. We pretty much let him go. Um, and since then, it's been a smooth sail since that kid's been gone and his father. Just no more nightmares, nothing. Harrington is part of the hockey development program at ProSkate, midway between Trenton and New York City, where a proactive approach is being taken to matters off the ice. We started a program with them, the league, the Atlantic Youth Hockey League started a program with them last year where we showed them a tape of behavior in the stands and we showed them what they're supposed to be doing, how they're supposed to behave, how they're supposed to be enjoying the kids and what not to do. And uh, we think that that's going to be helping us a little bit with, with some of the uh, people that are getting a little bit too uh, involved with either coaching, refereeing, and not watching and enjoying their, their player. A shortage of qualified coaches is definitely a problem in many New Jersey programs, especially with the number of players and the talent levels increasing. When I was growing up, I had some, some good coaches as I got older, uh, and I actually played for Coach Havlin when I played midgets up in uh, Wall, New Jersey, and uh, he was very uh, helpful in getting me up to juniors in Massachusetts where I went and played to further my career. It's getting better. I think that it's it's tough to get that quality person to get in there because it is a, is it a volunteer's position most of the time, and and I think people it's, you know if you really want to deal with the elite kids, it's gonna you're gonna have to travel, and it's it's tough for guys that you know to to have a full time job and the, and the coach that at this level and, and do the travel that they need to do to really expose these kids, and uh, but it's getting better. I see more and more guys, you know, that I. Uh, that I've played with or, you know, that now I'm involved with the USA Hockey in the summers and, and I see more and more guys in, the, in this area in New Jersey getting involved, uh, you know, to help these younger guys out. When Haviland grew up in the 70s, there were maybe five ice sheets in the entire state. Now there's 25. At this age, it doesn't matter wins or losses or ties or whatever. It more is focused on the developing of a kid, and I think that parents lose the focus um, of what's important. Similar to life, I mean, you need to work hard. Uh, you need to work hard in school. It goes all the same um, on the ice and off the ice. Hockey needs that ideology spread. The challenge is finding enough people to spread it. Well, that's going to do it here from South Jersey. Good. We'll be back next week all the way across the country again in San Diego for a very special story. We'll see you then.